Good afternoon, and thanks everybody for joining us for the final lap of the uh, OpenIDL industry test drive. This is the fast track to blockchain leveraging OpenIDL. This is our recap lap, or in uh, the agile terms, a retrospective, and we're gonna be walking through um, what we've done over the industry test drive and where we are ramping up to completing it and delivering the final report in our uh, use case to regulators. So as we, whoops, hang on. So again, my name is Truman Esmond, Vice President of Solutions and Partnerships at AAIS, and also the technical lead for OpenIDL and the chair of the Applications Governance Committee. Uh, and with me today, again, I have Bertrand Portier from uh, the CTO of Insurance from IBM, as well as Rao Vinakota, as well as several other of our, uh, from IBM, uh, one of our lead developers on OpenIDL, as well as several of other folks on our team uh, that are here and available to answer any questions that might come up. Uh, and, and certainly as you move forward in your journey with OpenIDL. So what we're gonna to do today is we'll do a quick recap of uh, the industry test drive, what we've done over the past couple of weeks to get to this point. Uh, and then we'll have Rao take you through the uh, behind the scenes or under the covers of what's happening through the open IDL data call. A bit of a recap of the, uh, the last data call experience that we went through, but really understanding what's happening uh, as it moves through the process and uh, towards the, the final destination. Uh, and then now that we've completed the industry test drive, what are your next steps? How do you actually get engaged uh, further with OpenIDL um, and, and hopefully with this new insight and perspective on the technology and the, and the platform, uh, what you might do to explore those possibilities and, and get started with it. So uh, over the last couple of weeks, um, we know back uh, the week of November 11th, we kicked this off with the webinar introduction to prepare the the industry test drive and, and let folks know what we're up to. And then over the last three weeks, uh, coming into today, starting the week of November 18th, we did the uh, the webinars describing the initially the introduction to OpenIDL, that went through the architecture uh, in detail. So you see where everything lives, the technologies involved, how it's deployed, uh, leveraging the, uh, the multi-cloud architecture, the IBM blockchain platform, the Hyperledger framework, as well as the unique elements within OpenIDL around the harmonized data store and the interaction patterns that uh, pro provide for the, uh, the data privacy and the unique configuration that OpenIDL offers. And then uh, Krishna took you through the virtually guided node install, um, which was a little shorter than 180 minutes. I think it was just over 90, um, which took you through the complete start to finish from your initial login to your uh, IBM cloud environment to actually deploying a node and participating in consensus. Uh, and then, uh, Rao took you through the data call experience uh, that Thursday, uh, showing exactly how the data flows through, uh, being in, uploaded to the peer through the APIs and how it uh, flows through ultimately to, to the analytics peer, which we'll be recapping a bit today. Earlier this week, we had office hours allowing folks that are participating to uh, ask questions um, and help their own uh, journey towards getting the, their own nodes stood up and participating in that consensus. And then today, we are at our final lap. Um, which is the final playback, again, reviewing what we've done over this uh, over this test drive uh, and bringing the results home, which we are preparing for the NAIC meeting, which is happening right now in Austin, um, where I'll be heading to this afternoon, and uh, where we'll be talking about the final report and presenting it to regulators as part of our design thinking session, our design thinking six workshop uh, in Austin on Tuesday, November, excuse me, December 10th. So, a uh, quick recap of what uh, OpenIDL is all about and why we're here um, to develop a network process or data product that supports the insurance industry and the ecosystem workflows, giving us that data controls and data security that we need, but also the fluidity and flexibility uh, and really trust in a platform with the timely interactions to trust the data that allows us to give the experiences to carriers, regulators, um, ultimately reinsurers and policyholders um, in this process to make insurance a much uh, easier place to work. Starting from our open IDL members, initially with insurers and regulators and advisory organizations, but expanding to uh, broader constituencies through the working groups, and the expansion of the platform. And coming from the foundation of the data access platform allows uh, each participant to control their data uh, and allow specific interactions, and in our case, to a regulatory data call, and then extending that to the different applications in the future based on that trusted data <clears throat> and using that trusted data for new interactions with new stakeholders and new transactions. So the value proposition uh, in, in that we wanna recap, again, today was the data owners, those that are in control of their data, and today those are for the carriers, um, where they get to, they 
get strategic value where they can do that last data conversion that they'll need to do. They'll put their data into a standard and, and standard format in a private and proprietary environment. So they have a direct control with common structures that'll allow transparent and secure interactions of, of untrusted third parties, be they regulators, be they agents, be they reinsurers, or even companies within their large, broader organization. Um, and as well as the process to be empathetic and accountable to, de to define these mechanisms for trust and the governance of that technology and standards moving forward. In the short term, this process is lightweight enough to provide near-term cost savings in addition to the long-term opportunities uh, as well and opportunities for employees to learn more, be redeployed into more valued, valuable functions uh, and, and be developed to be better positioned in the future. Certainly as AIS, we're, we're very excited about the new opportunity for regulatory relationships uh, as we see value from the regulator side as well. All kinds of new opportunities for insights and value uh, in what you can see as a carrier or a data owner relative to the broader pool of data in which you're participating in. Um, and then getting a new understanding and alignment with the broader member community uh, and other insurers uh, in your world. The, the big benefits is you know, data controls having a trusted authentic a trusted source of authentic data, um, massive potential for operational efficiencies, starting with statistical reporting, um, with FTE reductions and potentially millions of dollars in direct costs for some, in, the, in the case of larger carriers. And then the real strategic opportunity, which is choice, leveraging standards to have flexibility and choices in how you're developing and deploying products and, and how you're deploying them in the future for next generation products and experiences for your members. Regulators, uh, very similar as the untrusted third party in, in depending on interactions with data, um, gives them a great opportunity to empathize with the industry. It's not about regulation, it's about ensuring insurance works correctly and as it's supposed to, to provide resiliency uh, and risk mitigation and management support for the things that we may not uh, uh, fully expect but are planning for. Uh, so that regulators can actually design better purposeful regulatory policy instead of managing via audit, they can actually create a better, more aspirational box in which we'd like the industry to work within and shepherd towards a better future instead of a, a more punitive perspective. Industry insights and support resources can be developed based on this common understanding um, and really enforce, focusing the enforcement, uh, the, the negative consequences only in the problem areas and not making people that are abiding by the rules be, be subject to the lowest common denominator um, of, of uh, enforcement efforts. The opportunity to have this trusted data around policies and claims and really a trusted data platform increases the opportunity for public private par partnerships and more real time risk response and mitigation efforts as storms are approaching, for example, or uh, trends are changing and allows the, uh, you know, the government as well as the, the risk management industry, the insurance industry to respond and ensure society is, is better managed moving for, forward. Lots of tactical values in terms of more trusted data, certainly as our, our regulatory resources uh, are involved and educated, they get developed and again, redeployed more towards those value oriented activities, far better industry relationships, new insights and answers, particularly for these emerging trends or where we have uh, difficulty seeing into some of those shadowy corners or uh, in a more real time uh, uh, process. Uh, and again, further alignment with the, with the member community of insurance of everybody involved in the insurance uh, delivery and stakeholder chain. Data quality is the biggest thing right now. Insurers or uh, regulators are living off of and getting, you know, making policy decisions on data of questionable origin or of questionable quality or even or completeness. This gives them a much better perspective on that. They know, you know, we know that data is quality because it's auditable and it's being trusted by a broader community for different purposes. And we can improve the interactions that they have with the industry right away by allowing them to ask better questions of the industry with more purposeful and aligned uh, questions with the industry so that everybody is actually getting benefit from the this significant amount of work as data is pulled from the operational systems. Uh, by doing that and being able to leverage it further through standards creates the new opportunities that we have for for the industry to move forward and regulators to be involved as they need to be to have trusted products in the market as they have broader impact for more and more constituents. As these products become more broadly available, the regulatory burden uh, and regulatory necessity is that much higher. 
all facilitated through the architecture. I won't go too deep in here. We can I recommend you go back to uh, lap two if you want to the, the deep dive into it. Some of the thing, key takeaways are understanding that it is a blockchain centric network, um, that it is open, it is efficient, uh, and that it leverages a few additional technologies on top of the Hyperledger uh, core framework, including the harmonized data store, uh, the, the user interface that you saw and the APIs that allow interactions with that harmonized data store, and then the interaction patterns that bring information from, from each of the different peers to the analytics peer to allowing for, allow for the visualization. Um, the open platform is not just open to participation, but it is hybrid multi-cloud, so you can deploy it in the cloud of your choice um, with the exact control and distributed to the data owners um, to allow the direct control over their data. With that, I will hand it over to Rao to walk through the, uh, you know, behind the curtain and so you can see where data is going during the data call process as we wrap up our efforts over the last couple of weeks. Uh, so with Rao, I will stop sharing and hand it over to you. Thanks, Truman. Um, like Truman said, my name is Rao. I'm a developer here at IBM working on with AIS on developing OpenIDL. So two weeks ago, I did a deep dive walking through the data call process, and we're going to use this time to get a recap of the process and hit the major points and actually use the same data call that we issued um, back in November. So the first step where the data call starts is with the regulator, in this case, which is the government of Virginia. And so regulators through the OpenIDL UI will be able to issue data calls that advisory agencies like AIS and other carriers can interact with. And so the data call that we issued was the cause of loss data call here. And when you do issue a data call, there are several fields and information that you have to fill out before you can even save it as a draft, let alone issue it. And the first, obviously, is the name, jurisdiction, but part of it's also the description as well as the range dates. So these allow advisor agencies and carriers to get a better feel for the data that regulators are requesting. And the other fields, such as proposed delivery date, as well as the form URL we'll walk through later, are fields that AIS updates on the report. Other fields that regulators fill out before they save it as a draft is um, the purpose, detailed criteria and eligibility requirement. And we're hoping that here regulators are as verbose as they can be to really get so that they can really communicate why they're looking for the report, what they're hoping to see in the report, and carriers have a good idea of where their proprietary data is going. And just to get a quick feel of what a new data call would look like, now we get over here, like we mentioned earlier, all the fields are here. And one of the options we have with the data call is to save it as a draft. And what this does is it creates a separate intermediary before officially issuing the data call that lets regulators and carriers and even AIS interact with the call, interact with each other, and get a better feel of what data they're looking for and what data they're hoping to accomplish. And so before we go to the carriers, one of the things we want to show that uh, Truman mentioned earlier is that all carriers store their data in a harmonized data store. And we have carriers sitting on two types of nodes. The first is the multi-carrier node, which uh, handles both regulators and small carriers, as well as single tenant nodes. These nodes are uh, devoted just to one carrier, and so only that carrier's data is on there. And so this is a single tenant node database. So this is the harmonized data store here. You see the record. These, this five-digit number, 54321, is a carrier ID. It's a unique identifier that play, that is assigned to each carrier so that, that, so that the system can tell that that data is theirs. That becomes even more clear when on the multi-carrier we have multiple harmonized data stores. And so the, the, the software that we use to upload data from your on-prem databases will be able to sort through, you know, which company data goes to which harmonized data store based off the carrier ID. And so, you know, once a regulator issues a data call, AIS gets a chance to interact with it by setting a extraction pattern. And so what these extraction patterns are, are MapReduce functions that take the flat JSON that, um, that carriers upload and then reduce it into a data format that AIS can then work with and create reports off of.
And just to get a feel, this is where the extraction pattern is set. And to get a feel of what the extraction pattern looks like, we, get, we allow both AIS as well as carriers to download the extraction pattern and get a feel for, uh, for what they're using. And I will bring up this extraction pattern so we can view it. And while that's coming up, we you know we, we call them extraction patterns because it is you're doing that map reduce function. We're trying to, we're starting to call them interaction patterns because increasingly as we change the nature of data calls from uh, requesting data cubes, we're looking to change the extraction patterns to interaction patterns for more insights, gathering of insights rather than uh moving moving data uh, you know or sharing data it's actually asking better questions and getting more specific insights and learning more information to get the value uh, not just to move data Was that open and now? here we go yes we are all set so we've opened the extraction pattern excel and this function right here this uh, map reduce uh, function Rattle, sorry, I, I think you're still sharing just Chrome, so I, we can only see your web. Yep. Yeah. Oh, I apologize. No worries. Okay. Everyone sees this is the extraction pattern that we've opened in Excel. And this map reduce function here is, is what's going to work on the data. And what actually happens is it, it, it filters the data through so that when it gets to the analytics database that sits on the AIS node, we'll get it in a much different format than what carriers upload. And now that we've now that AIS has, um, has uploaded an extraction pattern and we know how to filter the data, carriers can consent to the data call. And when carriers consent, that triggers the data transfer process and filters the data from the harmonized data store that's either sitting on the single tenant node or one of the harmonized data stores on the multi-carrier node and, and filters down to the analytics database. And the analytics database is where AIS will then look through the data and create a report for regulators to see. And so one of the things that uh, that carriers can do is they can see a history of the data call between, you know, when the data call was issued, whether it's been consented to, and when the report delivery data is updated. You know, like we, in the previous dem demonstration, we consented to the report, and that consent is final, so we can't unconsent and pre-consent. And, and so the time of consent is recorded for posterity, so there is, you know, that blockchain immutability uh, promise finality that we can see exactly when this consent was recorded. There's no going back on it. And we constantly keep track of every change to the data call status. And so you're going to see that in, um, there are two carriers that consented. The one is this carrier, which is sitting on the single tenant. The second is the carrier that is sitting on the multi-tenant. And this ledger, when a regular sends out a data call, can be seen shared across all carriers sitting on the network as long as, as, uh, as they're connected to the blockchain network. And as you can see, this carrier consented to this data call back, um, back when we did the demonstration. And so now the carriers consent, and we see it, uh, now AIS can see the data in their analytics database, which is here, the data call um, insurance transaction database. And you're going to notice that obviously it's it's not the um, same number, a one-to-one -one match, as the documents have been reduced into a more digestible format. And now they have the data, AIS can then create a report for regulators to view. And this, the report process also has its, uh, its own interaction and gets recorded every time a report is proposed. 
And so this is where they have the option to create a report, and they would um, first provide a URL where where uh, where regulators can access the report. This has to come with a hash without the hash, and if the regulators don't have the matching hash, they can't access the report. And once that happens, and we log back in as a regulator, we'll see that a Kenda report has been submitted for our review. and the cause of loss has a CANDA report. And this is where the regulator now looks access report and has the ability to accept the report. If not, they can communicate if they don't want to. And this is, now they can, now the regulators have the report, this is really the end of the uh, data call process. Carriers uploaded their data, regulators sent out a data call, AAS looked on, set an extraction pattern, carriers consented, now that, that data filtered from the various harmonized data stores that the carriers had all the way to the analytics database sitting on the AIS node. AIS looked at that data, created a report, gave that report to, to the regulators. At this point, regulators would have the option to accept and publish. And We're not going to do that yet, though. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you were not going to do that yet, but yes. And, and so this is the kind of the, the full circle. Uh, of the data call process. And with that, I will pass it back to Truman. Awesome. Thank you, Ralph. Really appreciate it. And let me, so as I mentioned, we're not going to go ahead and click accept and publish it because obviously the report that Ralph submitted is is not the real one uh, that we would submit. We're actually preparing right now and that'll, now that all the data uh, is in there and we're pulling that together. I'm going to quickly share and I think and we have done before uh, an example of what these might look like in the future. So. Um, today, reports from regulatory, the regulatory reporting reports that the regulators receive um, are in the form of data sets, oftentimes even received in the, in, uh, via FedEx uh, on paper. Uh, so in the future, these data calls actually show up as dynamic visualizations uh, necessary or you know, to the purpose of the data call they're trying to answer. Do you need to see a dynamic visualization using uh, a a, a responsive interface, or is it simply, uh, is it could be a static PDF report with the, with the justifications behind it. Whatever the visualization is, or the ultimate result of that report could be, could be a simple yes or no based on the, on the, on the question that's being asked. Um, the Open IDL will be able to provide those in new fashions, and this is what we're going to be presenting to uh, regulators next week in, in Austin. So let me stop that, switch back to the back here okay so <clears throat> now that we've gone through that again thanks again Ralph for walking us through where that data lives and how it ultimately gets in a very private and secure way uh, from the controlled environments of the carriers to the intermediary environments of AIS as the statistical reporter and ultimately with the information necessary into the hands of the uh, untrusted party uh, in the form of regulators. So what do we do next? So now how do you leverage OpenIDL and this technology for your, for your own purposes? Uh, first, um, for regulatory reporting, uh, we can get in, in to get into the network is starting with an AIS membership agreement uh, for carriers. Uh, if you're not a carrier, an OpenIDL membership agreement, please reach out to, to me or Thomas or really any folks at IBM to help get that started. Very simple process. Um, that we can talk you through uh, and then actually getting involved and stood up in the network there's two places to get started the regulatory reporting use case which you saw outlined through this industry test drive and the two different ways that Rao just explained the, that for that process that regulatory statistical reporting process uh, to be performed either through a single tenant node where your data is in your peer that is in your cloud in your environment under your direct control that is roughly a six to eight week project in order to bring that uh, environment in and really the the work there um, as you saw could be done in 90 minutes but really the work is making sure that it's tied into your uh, your enterprise functions uh, certificate services APIs uh, 
data sources and, and again, cloud environments as well. That's where bulk of that time is. Um, or onboarding to the multi-tenant node where you would be leveraging an environment that AAIS hosts on your behalf as a statistical reporting um, member or affiliate with AAIS. Um, we would host that for you. And again, a lot of that is making sure that the data is able to be ingested into the platform. Uh, and that's where the bulk of that time is given that you don't have to stand up your own peer. Beyond that, you can certainly become a member and leverage AAI, excuse me, leverage OpenIDL for broader use cases beyond regulatory reporting that it, that it does today. Um, we would invite you to, or, or in, in, in addition to broader use cases, even using it in your own organization, we would invite you to participate or, or engage in a design working, thinking workshop with folks in your own organization across the different uh, silos or divisions or departments within your organization that may exist to see where a trusted data repository might benefit you internally, where you might leverage it uh, for regulatory reporting or other use cases, um, or or in uh, design thinking workshops around broader working groups with other vertical partners or companies that look like you that are, are facing a common problem in performing uh, that responsibility to the industry. Uh, we recommend again, reaching out to either AIS or IBM and we'll work with you putting those together. Those are usually two week projects to um, from, uh, from design to uh, implementation, of course, uh, calendars and schedules uh, aside. Take a few minutes for any questions that may come through now. Um, and again, reminding you that we have the whole team on the line right now to answer any questions. So we'll open the floor up to questions and move on here in just a minute. While we wait for our questions, uh, this is Bertrand from IBM. Um, one thing on the other use cases that you saw before on the previous page is that we really want to work with you and um, and you don't have to invest straight away in two weeks of your time. So the, uh, the initial investment would be let's spend half a day to a full day together yes. and do some uh, thinking and design around how you can leverage open IDL you know, for your specific organization, how we could potentially even extend the, the existing data model to support what you do uh, to allow you to participate and get value out of your membership. So what, what, I'm, what I'm going to say here is that we are flexible and we will work with you and you don't have to necessarily sign up for a long engagement to start with. We want to talk to you and have that initial conversation. Thanks, Bertrand. And, and we recognize that's really important. It's, we've designed this and, and are continuing to improve the process so it's as easy as possible to get started, um, as accessible and as open. Um, and, and really driven towards the value that, that your organization needs. And we recognize that everybody that participates in these is going to have different needs. Um, and let's, let's start that conversation. There's uh, no, no reason to wait. And uh, it's certainly a great time uh, to get started. So with that, we'll move, move things along here. Um, the last piece I wanted to leave folks with as we wrap up this industry test drive is a bit about OpenIDL and recapping the different places you might be able to participate or where you might find interest in working with OpenIDL. We are, again, a not-for-profit uh, organization made up of our members um, with the principles of being not transactional, really being a platform that you can take and leverage as easily as possible. And, and the benefit of leveraging it is really entirely on you and what value you're able to get derived from, from the platform. Um, with our committed members governing this platform, transparent operations, so you can see exactly what's going on and that ensures accountability across different aspects of the network, leveraging Hyperledger uh, for the open technology and ensuring we have empathy across the different stakeholders as we develop new applications, um, leveraging design thinking for the cross stakeholder working groups, making sure we're moving forward and building that empathy over time with quarterly workshops and making sure the technology is moving forward with releases every quarter as well. Structurally, we get the executive board, certainly the board of directors, as we're looking for senior personnel uh, to, to join the board, as well as technical senior technical personnel for the, for the Open IDL Technology Governance Committee that helps us determine what is actually deployed to the platform, what are the strategic uh, directions the technology will take. Then the three operational committees for the regulatory governance, data governance, and applications governance, um, working with how the platform leverages uh, or works with our regulatory community how the platform works with other industry applications and industries beyond insurance and the new applications of the data and technology. And then the data governance in terms of the standards and what types of the, the data standards, the harmonized data store will support 
uh, specifically around regulatory reporting and today and then around other future standards and, uh, as we move forward around homeowners, flood, auto and subrogation and reinsurance just to begin uh, through the working groups that we see over here on the right. So with that, I'll wrap it up for today and wrap up this first uh, industry test drive of OpenIDL. I want to thank everybody for their participation and attention, uh, both in watching uh, the, the test drive unfold before them, as well as their efforts in standing up nodes and peers to participate in this final report. Looking forward to talking to you further. Please reach out to myself, Truman Esmond with AAIS, uh, Burton Portier at IBM, or any of the other folks that you've been introduced to today, um, or of course, your, the representatives you have in either of those organizations. Thank you very much for your attention and participation, and have a wonderful holiday season. Cheers.